questions. Um, but certainly in the UK, we have, um, yeah, we have a, a large South Asian diaspora and we have a large um, Afro-Caribbean diaspora. Um, and um, the narrative that the Conservative Party um, use is that because um, they have a lot of ethnic represent representation, they can't possibly be racist in their, you know, in their behaviours and what they're doing. Um, and uh, yeah, for example, um, uh, um, Suella Braverman um, has been so fierce against uh, migrants um, and that she and Priti Patel both recognise that they would, they, their parents or their parents' parents wouldn't have actually made it to the UK had um, the UK had the policy that it's that it, it, it's having now against migrants. So I guess it's more of a question of um, how do we have a narrative uh, around uh, structural racism and structural colonialism and neocolonialism um, when the right are trying to use identity politics in that way to kind of hide their very racist structural policies. Does that make sense? Thank you. I love the questions about colonialism. First of all, uh, <clears throat> after the Germans left, the English took over. And uh, uh, that is when Namibia is part of the Commonwealth and the UK just removed uh, the visa. I mean, before Namibians could travel to the UK without needing visas because they are part of the Commonwealth, so now they removed it, question mark. Uh, um, because Germany lost its colony after the First World War, after that, the UK was actually in charge. So my question to the UK government is, have they not plundered our continents enough? Have they not? I mean, like right now, we want our gems back that are on your royal crown, you know? Uh, you are removing our right to actually travel to your countries. Germans, they don't need visas to come to Namibia, even though you've got historic responsibility, and so does the UK. The UK more than Germany, because Germany is okay, like a handful of countries. Uh, so I think we need to talk about accountability, and we must also start talking about what happens in history. None of you people are learning what actually happened. I am not just talking about the French, I mean, or the Germans, or the English, because none of you are taught what Fontrota did in Namibia. None of us are taught what Columbus and those people did in South America. We are saying, oh no, but we went to help the people. No, you did not come and help us. You came to exterminate our people. What is that nonsense? So, if we want accountability, we need to go back to, to that time when you said, me, I want this land. You came to enslave our people. Okay, not you, but your governments. They came to enslave our people. They are still doing it by taking a, a minerals for literally nothing. Our people are suffering. They don't have any rights to say anything. When we, when we talk, we are labeled as radical. Not that we care, you know? My father fought in the war. I was born in the war. So how many more generations does this system want to create? If the people are running over to the UK or to Germany, it is because we don't have a choice. The floods have devastated people. You know, uh, Malawi, uh, over 10 million people were actually uh, affected. How much money did the UN give? Nine million. So one dollar per person. What is that nonsense? Hmm? And now you have the people here at, uh, at the SB, uh, 58, the one that just happened in Bonn, where the, where the uh, Global North leaders are telling us that they have to be in charge of the loss and damage finance uh, if facility. What is that nonsense again? That is again them telling us how we should develop. So if we really want to tackle the root, go back to colonialism, we need accountability. Colonialism is not just the countries that came to occupy. It is also the companies that are still occupying our lands, that are taking our land from our people, and that are literally creating poverty, 
so their companies can actually make i mean so they can make more profits because even when you look at europe today i'm so sorry but there's so much poverty here people are also being affected here the climate crisis is also right here right now but who's the one that is making the money it is those institutions and it is those businesses and they need to be held accountable and we need historic recognition of all the genocides all of them i don't see why we are treating the jews differently from other indigenous nations humans are humans human rights violations are human rights violations fossil fuel extraction mining comes with human rights violations our aquifers have been polluted so we can continue providing minerals that certain companies are benefiting from but not our people so accountability that's my first one i'm just gonna ask the speakers to keep yeah, short yeah, yeah. so that i can have more yeah. that we can have more questions sure. um so pt patel's a joke right and sadi khan's a rich little shit. so just because you have and racism is a systematic issue, right? So um, having one or two people of color on your, I mean, Kamala Harris in the US, right? It's a warmonger. So um, I think what, what needs to happen is that the systemic issues need to be, t and like um, historical issues. So Britain's forgotten slave owners, right? How a lot of the wealthy people, actually most of the wealthy people, multi -white, wealthy white people in the UK, uh, have sold their slaves to the had to give up their slaves to the government who is still paying them back right so the monarchy why are these things still allowed to happen so if you want to fight systemic racism it's not about having one or two people of color in parliament it's about breaking fighting the things that still enable that continue that racism to continue so fighting the monarchy you know fighting the uh, the way that the government owns the ro the royal family owns property all over the place so it's about fighting the colonial systems as opposed to um, as well as rights for migrants and you know when I mean, you can't talk about climate justice without talking about all justice so um, yeah I would say fighting the systemic issues that can enable the colonial legacy to continue so, yeah. I, I was briefly say that nothing good will come from the UK government or most most European governments, especially empires like yours. So I wouldn't expect anything good to come from them. It's on us to build the power, to force their hand, to make them the right decisions. And I know this will not happen just out of solidarity. So you can't go back to England and say, hey, help us cancel the debt of the global south because it's the right thing to do, people are dying. We need to find ways and think outside of the box to engage with the workers' unions and the power players in society that tend to be more on our side. So maybe the best thing is to join them in, our, in their demos for social justice and slowly try to build international solidarity. And the idea that debt cancellation could actually enable the workers here to take a lead in climate action without shooting themselves in the foot. That we want to make the same billionaires that are destroying your lives here and that are destroying the global south, we can unite against that top 1% of the Davos elites and hold them accountable for their climate debt and make them pay, make the, bank pay, the banks pay, not the workers. I think that's a narrative that could be uh, attractive to the workers here and that could allow us to go from becoming antagonistic to the workers to for them to become protagonistic as they have to be. There's no other way. We don't have enough power. We have a lot of good ideas, but there's no way to implement them. Briefly, I think your question itself contains the answer and most things have already been said. Um, but I, I would point to the importance of turning to our own class, that's where it comes in because I'm brown and you are white, uh, but we are workers, yeah? And of course the system divides us on the basis of race and migrant status because these are differentiations that work uh, for the system much more than the benefits that you as a white worker would derive out of that. So I think that the point is to make white German workers conscious of the fact that we are one class and in the sense that our objective interest lies together, 
um, but there is no amount of consciousness that I could put in Bravaman or Priti Patel uh, that could achieve that because I do not share the objective interest of that cancellation over overthrowing capitalism with uh, Priti Patel or Rishi Sunak or whatever, you know, which I do share with you. So that's where I would say that this is a, a very good uh, avenue to have these discussions and push that further. Thank you. And if I can add to the, am I coupling? Oh, sorry. I'm behind the people. Let's see. Now it should work. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going to add a, one one thing about that, about uh, and maybe also for taking one of the questions that is going to come. But how do you relate to the working class in the global north with this, which is usually the question that comes. Um, so. We have done some work also on that in reaching out to, to labor unions and a lot of them are very positive and like, uh, hey, this is actually a really, like we want to support this, this is, this is great because also it's a, it's a proposal how working class people can engage in their fight, which is the fight against climate crisis and for so social justice, but they are not the ones who are going to pay for this. Um, but then at the same time in Germany we have this very peculiar situation that workers are not allowed to strike for political reasons, quote unquote. They are not allowed to do solidarity strikes and they are not allowed to do um, solidarity strikes with other sectors and they are not allowed to do a general strike. So we also have to build up these class consciousness on that it's actually your right to strike for, for whatever the fuck you think is right. Uh, so and the, to, to build this class consciousness as well again. And then also to keep in mind that it's very important to historicize, I don't know if that's a word. In German these kinds of new linguistic things always work, I don't know if they work in English but um, contextualize in the historic sense um, how also the working class in the global north got undermined. And one of the reasons, uh, one of the origins is actually the debt crisis in the global south in the 80s. We had a quite well organized uh, labor, labor union, labor movement, uh, the, the golden 60s in a way, in the global north, eh? uh, speaking of the global north. But then the debt crisis of the global south came uh, and the, the corporations were actually allowed a way out of well organized global north um, uh, countries to migrate into countries where repressions are much stronger, environmental stronger uh, standards were, were low, environmental quote unquote standards were lower and so on. So the global south um, crisis of the 80s actually cracked up, cracked open the global south for corporations to undermine the so-called the, the class contract that was done between uh, ruling class and working class. So just keep this in mind also that those crises are related and those struggles are related and are actually one struggle. We just have to fight against this particularization of the fights. Uh, and now more questions, <laughs> sorry. And I have a long uh, long cable here, so I can also give the mic to the back, or you come to the front. And don't be shy. <laughs> it's okay to ask questions. It's important to ask questions, please. I have only a small question because I find this topic always really complex and is there a, a gathering of books and articles about uh, in which oh, I'm sorry, yeah, too young, uh, which uh, Depth for Climate made or what, we, what do you recommend for the first steps for engaging this uh, topic in Yeah, we made a few documents and compilations. So if you want them, uh, what's the best way? Get our contact or email us at info at therefoclimate.org and we can send you the stuff. Also on the website, you can just sign up, no? Okay. And since we're talking about this, if any of you are doing your masters, your bachelors, your PhDs, and you would like to use your research to apply it for supporting grassroots groups and campaigning, we are creating a team of people that are doing their thesis, connecting them to these demands so that they can help us provide more arguments, citable data, and things, especially towards the 2025 horizon, because you can't do organizing without proper uh, academically so sound arguments that can help us counter the dominant narrative. So if you're interested in any way to put academics 
uh, to good use for climate action also, uh, contact us and we would love to work with you. very good with words so uh, excuse me if I don't phrase the question correctly but um, if in the imaginary world where yeah debt is cancelled um, but one what would be n next that's like my my first question and then I think like the second part of the question is that I in Mexico we already pay like 1 million pesos in um, uh, IMF um, loans every day and it's it really hard to convince workers to join any type of movement because they know that anybody else would do the work that they're doing for cheaper like it so they won't strike so how would I appeal to um, like me as a person from the climate movement how would I appeal to a worker that knows that somebody else, because of capitalism, were already competing to cheapen each other out. I don't know if that was clear. Okay. System change, I think that's something that we've already mentioned here quite a bit. Um, what is next? Well, what is next is that we will be free from this debt and we will be able to develop in our own ways. You know, we will not have to do fossil fuel extraction, for example, because, you know, the reason why we are doing it is because we owe, we owe people, you know. So it would, it would be, um, Thing with um, emancipation, okay, dependency, but it will break the chain of dependency. And I also understand why workers in the global south also don't tend to protest. I think um, activism or climate activism is actually a privilege because not everyone can do it. Uh, in some countries, people are jailed, others are killed. Um, in South America and Southeast Asia, also Africa, obviously. Um, uh, climate activists are literally dying every day. Right now in Turkey you have uh, senior citizens that are being harassed by the police because they're trying to stop the expansion of a coal mine. Um, so affected communities, they tend to speak up more, but not everyone speaks up because you need to ask yourself, okay, now I'm going to strike, but what am I going to feed my child? You know, how am I going to pay for my child's school fees because we don't have free education like we have here. Uh, we don't have most of the benefits that people have here, like uh, uh, healthcare. Uh, it, is, it is very ambiguous, but the cancellation at least would mean that instead of having to pay back money to some colonizers, we would be able to also divest that money into our people and also alleviate that specific poverty within our own systems. But the continuation of the debt is the continuation of colonialism, even though we don't call that anymore. And I think it would also help a lot of people in the global south for them to focus on other things than um, constantly just having to work. You know how many people here can go to the cinema, can go see an exhibition? Well, others, they don't even know what that means. They don't even have the privilege of doing things that can, you know, nourish them um, intellectually, you know, because you have to put the bread on the table. If you don't, your child is going to starve. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's a really important question uh, that we had not fully addressed before. First of all, there is a group in Mexico, Dead for Climate Mexico. They are working with the Congreso Nacional Indígena. I think they're connecting to labor unions, so we can put you in touch with them. Um, but also, like Minerva said before, if that is cancelled, what is there to guarantee that we're just not going to fall back into it when the system is made for it? That's why what we are doing 
is doing it from the other way around. We're not expecting the British government to hunt down or any government or the cops to give us down. We're gonna use them as tools. We're gonna try to get them back from the fossil fuel industry that has co-opted them. But we're not expecting anything from the top down. We need to build it from the bottom up. And the only way to do that, as we see it, is a, a really strong international network of labor unions that are calling for this debt cancellation, who have the power to paralyze the economies and to do so internationally, together with the indigenous movements, feminist movement, climate, social, and so on that we've been talking about, so that then there will be a powerful movement that will enforce that cancellation. This will only happen when we force it to happen, not necessarily by force, but we must force the hands of the leaders. Because most of them, they don't wanna, most of them are corrupt, most of them are put there by the IMF and the World Bank in the first place, and some of them are not, let's say Petro. Petro is going far enough to start talking about the debt, but he's not calling for debt cancellation. He's asking for the IMF to, uh, to apply the debt swaps that they're calling, which are kind of bullshit. It's a totally lacking sovereignty, touching only a small amount of debt, usually losing sovereignty and, and affecting the indigenous communities, privatizing the land, giving it to WWF or some other bullshit NGO from the global north. But Pedro also is doing what he can. In politics, you don't do what you want, you do what you can. Our job as a social movement is to change how much they can, to, uh, to broaden the spectrum of what Petro can do, to put pressure on the streets so he can do more. Because he doesn't want to end up like Thomas Sankara, who inspired us to build this movement by building a global front against debt. No single country of ours is strong enough to stand up to the IMF. The leaders will be killed the next day. We will only stand up if we build a global common sense and a global network of movements that must have the workers at the core. So that's what we are after. We are not uh, begging and we are not expecting anything top down. Once we get that cancellation, will be because we will force it to happen. And once we force it to happen, we will also have the power to prevent it from happening again and to guarantee and safeguard and have, be vigilant on how those resources are used by with having the indigenous and the workers and the other movements at the table. So the decision making is democratic and it's not again corrupt to use the money for more greenwashing and more colonialism. last question <laughs> who wants to have the uh, maybe the last question and then the last closing round of statements from here I think we have a common consensus that that cancellation is necessary and everybody of you is going to join because we just convinced everyone that it's necessary mm -hmm. <laughs> cool I know this is not how consensus work by being silent don't worry <laughs> Okay, then I'm just gonna invite everybody to have a last moment, a uh, last uh, contribution, and then we free our speakers to enjoy the rest of the panel. Uh, the climate camp, sorry. Closing remarks. Oh. Um, I think, thank you very much for your solidarity. Thank you, Ende Gelende, for having organized this. Um, I think it's very uplifting when we have spaces like this where we can, you know, just exchange ideas and just try and understand what is really going on on the other side. As you know, your media does not really cover what is happening ar around the world. Like, you don't, I am not sure if many of you are aware of what is happening in Mozambique. And I'm also talking about what is happening in Sudan, but we know what is happening in Ukraine. So. You know, racism is deep. It is even like the media is also controlling all of this. And, and I'm sure that you're not also aware or you may not be aware of most conflicts that are happening on the African continent, which are actually being driven by uh, the extractive industries. And, um, and also most of it is also because, yeah, people are corrupt. The ones who corrupt are never punished. It's all. It's just the president. So, you know, like for example, the Nigerian president here, Abacha. You know, Nigeria is one of the top producers of oil in Africa. 
this guy was so corrupt, they took his money, even this Mabuto Seseteko from uh, Congo DRC, Zaye, if you used to call it. Eh, you know, his, all of his assets were confiscated. Where's the money now? It is here. It is here in the global north. The people are still not benefiting from it, and we are still pushing this extractiveness because uh, people need money. The scientists even say, if we start mining our dump sites, we may not even have to start taking minerals out of the ground. I mean, you saw what happened to Nitarat because, I mean, you can see. I mean, it is here in your country. So you, most of you are aware about, of, uh, of, you know, what happened to Nitarat. And that is even sophisticated. Hmm? You must come to our places. People are losing their homes. People are dying. People's, people that don't have water to drink anymore, like in Kavango, for example, which is a beautiful region. Last time I spoke to the people there, they told me that the water, um, the taste of the water has started changing. They also told me that um, they're starting to experience water shortage. Why? Because we are using the water to you know, to mine oil, which is not even there, because apparently it seems like it's even a stock exchange scam. But the government is supporting it. The Canadian government is supporting it. The Norwegian government is supporting it, but the people are suffering. And yet again, our government still has to continue borrowing money so they can, you know, have a healthcare facility, education for children. But at the same time, we still have children that are being taught under trees, because the money is being stolen by political leaders. So debt cancellation is, is a way forward to ensure that justice is for everyone. And when I mean everyone, I'm not just talking about color. Like my sister said, it's also about class, but most important of all, it is breaking the chains of colonialism. That is what we need to do. Accountability and breaking those chains. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, that's, that's a lot. So, um, I also think that if, you know the left also needs to look inside itself. If we're, you know, we like especially within the climate justice movement, it's seen as quite racist in a lot of lots of parts of the world because there's you know we're talking about numbers, we're talking about 1.5 degrees, we're talking about carbon emissions, we're talking about coral reefs and animals, but we're not really talking about the people who are actually being impacted by the climate crisis. So, I mean, one example is, you know, I see Ukrainian flags everywhere, but why don't we see flags, um, you know, Yemeni flags, or Sudan, or, um, you know, anywhere else where there's the biggest humanitarian crisis in the world, or Iraqi flags, where, you know, the, I mean, Iraq's been, the victim of an insane psycho America war because of oil, right? But I don't see Iraqi flags everywhere like I do with Ukrainian flags. Why don't we see, you know, as much love going into climate refugees as we do for, for white Christian refugees, right? So we can't be talking about the climate justice and climate crisis without talking about all justice, right? So we can't talk about climate justice without talking about justice for refugees, for climate refugees. We can't talk about climate justice without talking about um, justice, food sovereignty and water sovereignty and people having homes and people having you know, access to, not even around the world, but also in Germany, people having access to all the same rights as everybody else, right? If we wanna talk about decolonialism, we can't pick and choose which decolonialism is important Right, we can't just be talking, we need to be talking about the decolonization of Palestine. We need to be talking about the decolonization of Namibia, right? Which has, I mean, all the white people in Namibia speak German. So we have to be picking, we, we have to be choosing all justices that we're fighting for. If we keep separating climate justice from all other justices, it's always gonna be seen as a racist, separatist movement that sees itself more important than working classes and than people of color. And this is super, super scary. And it's really something that's gonna bring the climate movement down if, if we don't look inside ourselves and see what we're doing wrong and how we can make it better.
Um, so first of all, thank you, Louis, for your energy and for always organizing such wonderful events. And also thank you for coming here, everybody. Um, I'll just say my last word on the most important question, I think, which is what is to be done. Um, so debt cancellation and international solidarity work is only possible if we arm ourselves with the weapon of the strike. And that weapon can only be effectively used if we have something to fall back on. And that is why what Louise said about our trade unions is so important. In Germany, we don't even have the same protections as the UK for industrial action. We can tire ourselves endlessly uh, with discussions about debt cancellation, but I hate to break it to you, that nothing is going to happen unless we build and democratize our unions. If we are serious, we need to be active in building our unions. So join your union if one exists for your trade or build one if there isn't. But don't just stop there. Fight for actual democratic trade unions whose leadership is accountable to the membership and recallable when they fail to act on the will of the membership. If we want to really bring about the death of debt, then we need to organize not just for the sake of it, but rather organize with the power to strike work because that's the only thing that's going to change things. So thank you. Yeah, and I think we are all very aware that the climate movements are at a crossroads, that we are all at a difficult time, and that we need to think outside of the box and also be humble, because we need to acknowledge the, the difficulties and the failures and think of why. And my diagnosis is that Eurocentrism will only lead to more failures, that this is an incomplete diagnosis of the problem and an incomplete approach to how to solve it. Until and uh, unless you can decolonize the climate movements of the global north with practical ways to work together internationally, there will be no significant climate action that can, that can solve the problems. Debt, for example, how is it possible that until recently debt was not even mentioned in the climate movements, and much less still not mentioned in the Paris Agreement and all the official bullshit, of course. But I think that reflects on what is lacking and that we need to come together. And, and I see as a lack of global strategy, decolonized strategy, that some movements are radicalizing their tactics. But there was a wise man from China, Sun Tzu, who wrote The Art of War, which I recommend to you to read, because that's another thing. Why are we afraid to think in terms of strategy? Why, you know, West Point, all the strategy is being studied by Wall Street bankers, by the West Point Military Academy in the US for war, in sports, but the climate movement doesn't have a fucking clue about strategy. What's up with that? So if we cannot uh, organize ourselves around strategy, we are going to fail. And what this man said, Sun Tzu, 2000 or more years ago, is that strategy without tactics is the slowest path to victory, but tactics without strategy is the fastest way to defeat. So if you radicalize your tactics without a proper global strategy, we're going to end up becoming the scapegoats of the next fascist movements that are going to antagonize us with the workers. So let's find a decolonized, integral, global strategy for climate justice. Thank you. And I'm gonna uh, take the privilege of having the last word. <laughs> Um, and I just want to briefly mention one thing also about the Mexican comrade who, who asked this question about that cancellation is really about um, creating the possibility for talking about the what, it, what then. Because the same argument with fossil fuel extractivism works with, for example, agriculture. Entire countries need to complete like deforest, deforest they cut down their trees uh, and abolish their forests uh, and create the entire agriculture into cash crop oriented agriculture just to somehow buy in the dollars to pay back their debt so as long as this system of purposeful indebtedness is in place there is no transition away from fossil fuel extractivism or from the system of extractiv uh, extractivism itself so the debt cancellation demand is really a demand to create even the possibility for change because as long as it's in place change is not going to happen because countries just somehow need to pre produce dollars uh, to pay back the debt, otherwise there's the military of the global north who's going to invade. Um, so that's just my two cents about that. I have two two little points to make. We have stickers here. I know that everybody loves stickers here, so we produce stickers, of course. 
I have one favorite. I think you will guess it uh, and take as much as you want, as many as you want. And I just want to make you aware of the, we are organizing a screening tonight at half past uh, eight. Uh, I think it's somewhere down there in one of the tents, I think the workshop tent seven, the one that is furthest away um, of a, um, Mexican feminist cabaret about to bring uh, a feminist perspective on the whole topic of uh, of debt and on, on the debt of in, in Latin America in particular. We're gonna have uh, comrades from Mexico joining who organized this cabaret to answer question and also to introduce the cabaret. And we're also gonna show a little video uh, that I haven't seen myself yet, so it's gonna be a bit of a surprise what our comrades produced in, Mex in Debt for Climate Mexico to just uh, explain a little bit what this entire demand has to do with Mexico and what our friends are doing there. So if you wanna, if you haven't had enough and you absolutely want to see more and know more and have amazing chants in your head, it's a cabaret in, in uh, Spanish with um, English subtitles, then uh, come to our screening tonight at 8.30. And now you're free to leave. <laughs> Thank you.